Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. Today we're digging into the peanut industry. And although peanuts are not the first crop you think about when you think Oklahoma, farmers have been growing these legumes here since before statehood. So today we want to take you inside a peanut processing facility and look at some unique ways peanuts are being sold. We begin with SUNUP's Austin Moore. You know, farming is a business, but it's also, it's something that's inside your blood. And uh, when, when I look at this dirt, I don't see just dirt. I mean, I see something, a personal bond to it. Stephen King is rightly fond of his farm in Caddo County. He nurtures this land and coaxes peanuts from its sandy soil. Since the legumes set fruit underground, and all of these mature at different times, patience is required right up until the rush of harvest begins. Once they feel like the majority of the peanuts are pretty far along, then, then they, they dig and they'll run a digger through the ground and it just basically cuts the plant off a few inches under the ground, under the peanuts, cuts the vine, and then it pulls the plant up, shakes the dirt off, and turns them upside down so you've got your plant laying upside down with the peanuts up in the air. And then those need to dry down to a to a fairly low moisture. Generally, you want to have these peanuts out of the field, dig them and have them combined in a trailer within four or five days. This year, we've got some that have been laying for two to three weeks. The longer they lay, this hay becomes more brittle and becomes harder to work with. Uh, the peanuts become very dry. You start uh, running issues of them splitting or shelling, uh, which when they shell, uh, you uh, basically get about a third maybe of what they're worth. And this crop is worth a lot, not just to the producers, but to the state and even the nation. The United States is seen as the best quality peanuts in the world. And uh, oftentimes we may be priced out of the market because of the quality, because it's competition with countries that delivering poorer quality crop at a lesser price. But, uh, but also because of the quality, uh, they reach out to the United States to meet those high-end uses and, and quality products that they're trying to produce. The U.S. is the third largest producer of peanuts behind India and China. Canada is our largest export market, taking 96,000 tons in 2012, with Mexico and the European Union also being important markets. As for Oklahoma, Kubitschek says we are generally in the middle of the pack for all peanut production, but that we are second in the U.S. in terms of Spanish peanuts. I think Oklahoma is unique in that we're, we're geographically positioned to where our producers can grow three different types of peanuts, uh, and it's well in demand because of the quality. We're 99.9 percent .9 irrigated, which is, is quite unusual in the peanut world. And uh, so year in, year out, we've been able to maintain uh, near record yields. and. Uh, each year it just sort of improves based on improvement in genetics, new, new varieties, new technology that farmers are eager and willing to adapt. This is the cattle research station and we do peanut research here. And uh, this field in particular that we're planting right now is infested with a disease called sclerotinia blight. John Damacone is a plant pathologist with Oklahoma State University. We're uh, trying to develop varieties or at least identify variety, peanut varieties that are resistant to sclerotinia blight and also looking at uh, fungicide programs that farmers can use on more susceptible varieties. Diseases are, are an issue in wheat and some in canola and some other crops, but they're not as serious as they are in peanuts where the farmer actually spray uses a fungicide program to control leaf spot, uh, various soil borne diseases, sclerotinia blight. So the farmer will spray three or four times a year to control diseases. That's not done in any other crops that I know of in the state. Of course, research and development of new lines considers other ways to improve the crop as well. We have an excellent team of USDA ARS scientists, Oklahoma State University scientists. Uh, they have developed genetics that have proven uh, to be a great payback to our producers. Kubitschek is talking about the development of peanuts with a high ratio of oleic to linoleic acid. Our farmers are gaining $100 per ton advantage over all other states because of the high oleic peanut. Oleic acid is heart healthy and it provides a greater shelf life to the peanut. 
from the consumer point of view, it's it's a better quality product. From uh, the uh, manufacturer's point of view, that's what they want. And so they're paying our producers a premium for that kind of, of peanut. Now these are developed through traditional breeding. These are not GMO peanuts. So this was developed, uh, it was identified in, in a population of peanuts and it's been bred, conventionally bred into the varieties that we grow. And what a sight the crop is. It's a beautiful crop to see in rows. But the payback is at harvest time. You don't know what that crop is until you turn it over and you pull it out of the ground. It's kind of like Christmas morning. You open that package that you've been looking at all year. Whereas perhaps with wheat or corn or other crops, you, you drive by and you see it every day. The surprise comes at harvest time and when you see those nuts inverted, shining in sunlight in rows, acre after acre, there's a great deal of satisfaction. That satisfaction is what keeps Stephen King toiling in his sand. To me, this isn't just a job. I mean, I feel like I'm contributing in some form or fashion to uh, providing for somebody else. And it's, uh, there's a lot more involved in what a lot of people realize, I believe. From Caddo County, I'm Austin Moore. To Marshall County now, where earlier this year we got a behind the scenes look at how peanuts are processed at the famed Texoma Peanut Company in Medill. We have a lot of growers go through our plant and when they get through they have a whole better understanding and then when we go to their farm and visit them we have a much better understanding of, of what they're up against and the things that are problems to them. So it's just uh, the relationship that you build with your with your farming customers. It's just very important to know each other's business. And this is where the farm and the sheller meet. The precise choreography of people, machines, and crops that takes place every day is remarkable. Peanuts from Mississippi, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas come to the Texoma Peanut Company to begin the transition to a great end product under the name of Clint Williams. Round and round. It's not a cracking process like you do with the cons, but it's a crumbling process. And it just crumbles the shell and the peanuts go through. You send them through the biggest grates first and then size them back to the medium-sized grates. Down in there, and that, this is what comes out. So these will go back first? Right. Uh -huh. Only the biggest ones get shelled on the first pass. The peanuts will travel through what seems like miles of shellers and sifters before making their way for color inspection. It's looking at each and every peanut that comes through and making a decision on whether it's too light or too dark. And if it's not within the parameters, it activates a little jet of air that's 100 PSI and blows that peanut out of the screen. Then the nuts arrive in the final room for a visual inspection before they're stored and then bagged. In fact, this is where that step used to happen before the equipment we just saw went online. All of our peanuts, we never drop them more than six inches without a spiral or a, a slant because we want to keep them whole and not crack them. But this will hold a full truckload of peanuts. Each one of these bins around here will hold a full truckload of peanuts. This is the bottom of each of those bands. We have nine on each side, uh, and we shell all night long into those bands. And when we they come in the morning, the bands are all full, and they start bagging them off. And they they do them one bin at a time, and then when they get it done, they close it off and open up the next one. And they work all day long, and at the end of the day, all the bins are empty, and they go home and let them start filling up again. Some of the peanuts continue to another processing plant down the road. That's where they're blanched, skins removed, and made ready for candies enjoyed all over the world. And when the peanuts leave Medill... There are no more than five pieces of farm material per semi-truck load. They're that clean. And usually the farm material is just a little stem or a uh, uh, unshelled little peanut. So uh, we have two lines. The first line is the cleaning line. There's no heat involved with that. And then we have our blanching line, which is a, a, over a 100-foot dryer. We have nine chambers. The first six chambers gradually heat the peanut up to about 190 degrees. 
and then we start cooling it down first with uh, ambient air and then the last two chambers are refrigerated air and when they come out you can put your hand on them and you can't feel hot or cold. The nuts are then held nearby before the next step, which is removal of the skins. And up here, there's two rubber rollers, and they're, they're going together like this, pulling the peanuts through. And one roller is going slightly faster than the other one, so when they come through, it's like taking the peanuts and doing like that. Then they're on the move again, and eventually pass through this final visual inspection, because nothing is sharper at this stage than the highly trained human eye. Not all of the Clint Williams peanuts go through this many steps. In fact, they're well known for their in-shell peanuts. The finest in-shell peanut in the world is the Israeli giant. It's the biggest and the brightest and the very best, and they only grow them in Israel. They get a huge premium for them. We're number two. We come in right underneath them, and uh, Italy is probably our prime market for that, but we sell them in Spain and Germany and France and all, all the other European countries. When we got into in-shell peanuts, Clint said we need something to set us apart. So the yellow mesh bag was twice as expensive as burlap, but we said we'll go that expense for the advertising value. And putting peanuts in a yellow mesh bag is like taking an average looking lady and putting her in a $500 dress. They just look nicer. And it's worked. For 45 years now, the yellow bag is instantly recognizable. Uh, the Clint Williams name is known all over the world. That means a lot to me and uh, in honor of my father-in-law that, uh, that started the company. And uh, it just, and it's associated with quality and integrity and, and uh, service. And that's, uh, that's what we stand for. I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Farmers and ranchers are thankful that wheat and canola crops are in good shape across most of the state. While November has been a real mix of rainfall and temperatures, it was the weather in October that got our winter crops off to a good start. September came in at 2 to 4 degrees above the 10-year Mesonet average. Air temperatures in October were slightly below average by 1 to 2 degrees. The dry southwest was 1 degree above the 10-year average with a broad band right at the average. Soil moisture was lacking in most of Oklahoma in September. There were a lot of brown colored areas on the map of fractional water index at the 10 inch depth. These were areas of low soil moisture. The green colored areas with good soil moisture were isolated. Fortunately, our dry September gave way to a wetter October. The October map of soil moisture shows the turnaround, with the switch in color to much more green and much less brown. The good soil moisture in October and mild temperatures have given farmers and ranchers something to be thankful for, and it's why Oklahoma's wheat and canola are looking good. Here's Gary with the winter outlooks for temperature and precipitation. Good morning, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving to y'all. Hope you've had a great time with your family and friends. Everybody wants to ask, what's winter going to be like in Oklahoma? Well, the standard answer would be, well, sometimes it's going to be warm, sometimes it's going to be cold, sometimes it's going to be wet, sometimes it's going to be dry. The classic weatherman answer, right? Well, we do actually have a little bit of input from the National Weather Service's Climate Prediction Center. So let's see what they see for this coming winter season. First, we'll look at the precipitation outlook for this winter. Now, the Climate Prediction Center doesn't see many things for Oklahoma equal chances, which basically means there's an equal chance of above, below, or near normal precipitation for the December through February period. That's not to say it's going to be normal or an increased odds of normal, but all three are possible for that three-month period. Now the temperature outlook for winter has a little bit more of a clue for Oklahoma. It does show increased odds of warmer than normal temperatures across most of Oklahoma. So 
it's not necessarily going to happen and it won't always be warmer than normal, but on average over those three months, they look for Oklahoma to be warmer than normal. So some folks will like that, some folks won't. Finally, what does the Climate Prediction Center see coming for the drought uh, situation we have in Oklahoma, especially Western Oklahoma? Well, I'm afraid if you look from now through the end of February, they see that drought persisting and even intensifying and developing in parts where there's no drought across Western Oklahoma. Now that's not good news for the folks who have been really mired in drought for more than three years now, but unfortunately, that's what the Climate Prediction Center sees, and it doesn't necessarily have to happen. So we can hold our hopes that we actually see some relief this winter. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Now we want to talk about the business side of peanut production with our crop marketing specialist, Kim Anderson. And Kim, let's start off looking at the loan rate for peanut producers and how that can influence prices. Well, the loan rate sets the foundation for the producer's uh, price. Uh, all peanuts in Oklahoma and Texas are essentially placed under the government loan, and that loan rate, oh, somewhere around, around $355 a ton, is the base price or the minimum price that producers will receive. How do producers turn around and sell their peanuts? Well, the shellers uh, offer the producers an option contract. It says that the producer will put the peanuts under loan. The producer will receive, say, $355 a ton for the peanuts at that time. When the sheller needs the peanuts, they pay the producer the difference between the market price and the loan, loan rate and assume the loan. So the producer keeps the loan money. The, the shellers assume that loan and take care of that and they give them additional money between essentially the loan rate and the market price. So then how do shellers determine the market price? Well, the shellers they determine the market price by seeing what the processors are paying for, for peanuts. They talk to the broker to see what uh, brokers are paying for the peanuts, and they're looking at the export market. Uh, the shellers take a lot of risk when they buy those, those peanuts because there is no central location uh, for selling peanuts, and they have to look at the market as a whole. And finally, are those prices reported anywhere? Uh, the USDA does report uh, some prices. Uh, NAS reports the uh, farmer stock prices. Shelter prices aren't reported anywhere. They haven't done that for the last two or three years. And so that's one of the problems in marketing peanuts. There is no really good price quote that you can, that you can compare what you're receiving to. Okay, Kim Anderson, how about a couple of peanuts? I there? love goobers. Okay, we'll <laughs> see you later. Thanks a lot. As we're visiting about the peanut industry in Oklahoma today, I thought it'd be a good idea to discuss what we know about the feeding of some of the byproducts of that industry to cattle. In particular, it would be peanut hay. Peanut vine hay, as we know it here in this state, would basically be the crop residue that's left after the, the peanuts are harvested. When I checked with the Oklahoma State University Soil Water Forage Testing Laboratory last week, uh, three different samples of peanut hay had been tested over the last calendar year and they ranged in protein from 8 to 10 percent crude protein which makes that a, a viable possibility as a hay crop for especially adult cows. As we're talking about peanut vine hay we've got to be aware of what those that peanut crop had been treated for be, before the, the crop was harvested. In many cases, those particular products are contraindicated for use of the hay with the cattle. There is another kind of peanut hay that you may hear about, and that's called perennial peanuts. Perennial peanut is a forage crop that's grown as an alternative to alfalfa in the Deep South. And as you can see by this graphic, basically those states and those areas where perennial peanut hay is grown. This is a crop that looks to be very, very nutritious and useful for cattle. It's a legume and is put up as a forage crop. And I, I tell you about this because I think it's important that if there's a situation in a, in a drought where we have to buy some hay from other areas of the United States, that as we talk about perennial peanut hay, that's a very, very different product than the vines that, uh, that we produce here in Oklahoma. Finally, there may be an instance where the raw peanuts, 
uh, shelled, those that won't pass the grade to be used for human consumption might be available for, for livestock feed. We have to keep our limit to uh, no more than four pounds per head per day of that particular product to cows. If we go above that with that high fat content, we may cause some digestive disorders in the cattle and certainly reduce the forage digestibility that goes along with it. If there's any aflatoxin in those peanuts, certainly they cannot be fed to dairy cattle and it needs to be extremely low, around 100 parts per billion or less if being fed to reproducing beef cattle. Well, this is some of the information that we could gather that we thought would be helpful to those folks in the peanut industry that might be thinking about using some of these byproducts as feed for the cows or the stalker cattle on their operation. And we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. Not all peanuts are sold through shellers. We want to take you to Caddo County now to revisit a grower who's taking his product directly to the consumer. Here again is Sunup's Austin Moore. This is where we sell the peanuts, get them ready, start packaging to deliver to grocery stores. Lloyd Lassley and his family have been growing Oklahoma peanuts since the days of Dust Bowl well, I mean, well, and Depression. Well, well, well. well, my granddad started raising peanuts in 1936, and then he started raising foundation seed for the Oklahoma Foundation Seed Stock in 1936. Now, there was a, a change for you all a while back, I guess the Farm Bill change, and that's where you got into the direct marketing where you needed to change your operation. Tell me a little about that. Okay, it, it was back uh, in the 2001 when the farm program changed. They did away with the quota system. Uh, I would see how much peanuts were selling at some grocery stores and I thought I could deliver a, a better product at a more reasonable price to the consumer. So I went to the health department, worked with them, went to the Food and Ag Products Center, went through some basic training with them and uh, got our plan approved and put in a certified packaging room or a certified kitchen and started processing the peanuts that way. And the business continued to evolve first selling just raw and roasted peanuts, it wasn't long before Lloyd's mother began adding candy peanuts to the family's product lineup. It looks done, but I can tell by the peanuts that it isn't. About the time I think I have it figured out, I need to figure something else out. <laughs> the weather plays a part in it. So what is your most popular item now? Probably the roasted and peanut brittle. Okay. Don't you Nothing think? like the classics. Mm -hmm. Now you're direct marketing everything you do. This mm -hmm. isn't all, none of this goes to distributors. This is no, that's you know. right. We market uh, mainly directly to some grocery stores with the raw products uh, in the produce section, and then we process our own for roasting, making candy that we sell at the farmers market, and that we also mail order, ship everywhere. So, Demona, if someone's going to make a change like this, something so dramatic as going from uh, traditional sales through a co-op and so on to direct sales to a client, what, what kind of challenges does that face in terms of just making the change in the first place? Yeah, there are a lot of things to think about, and I think uh, you think about both what's happening externally and then what's happening within the business and what your strengths and weaknesses are there. Mm -hmm. So the, in thinking about what's happening externally, you need to learn as much as you can about that. And so talk to lots of people. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's not your specific product, there may be people who've learned from experience so you can avoid their mistakes in going down a similar path for a, a different product. Um, it probably means stretching your comfort zone. So reading beyond things, talking to people that maybe you no, don't normally do because you've got to broaden your horizons to understand that outside market. Right. Um, and thinking about your business internally, you need to understand what kind of financial position you're in to know what kinds of risk you can take. Mm -hmm. um, you have to understand not only the people that you have, but what they're willing to do, what their skills are, whether they're willing to learn new kinds of skills, and also know about your physical resources, so what your land capability is, um, if you need new machinery and equipment, those sorts of things. You're saying it's basically about understanding your own strengths and weaknesses. Sure, yeah, and not just your personal ones, but those of the other people that you're working in, in business with. So you don't have to do everything yourself. Uh, you can uh, rely on other people, and it's certainly important to, to talk to other people. Mm -hmm. and, and skills can be learned, and so if people are willing 
to change and adapt. There are lots of things you can do differently. But despite the challenges, for this Oklahoma family, the choice was simple. Now, if you tried to stay doing things as you had before that, that farm bill change, yeah. would you be it, doing this now? No, uh, probably wouldn't. Uh, we more or less focused on seed production at that time for the foundation seed. Okay. And so this was a way that we continue to maybe increase, replace that lost income that we had. And yet you're still making the same product your grandfather made. Yes, that granddad started. We're trying to uh, improve on that and keep it going. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about a lockout on maybe electrical appliances or power tools. Yeah, you've got some stuff that you'd prefer not to, to get operated or you have some little hands around that you want to keep safe. There's some real quick, easy ways to do that. One is just to, to take a kind of a key ring and, uh, and put that onto the plug. And as you do that, now it cannot be plugged in. Another little simple thing you can do is get the little TSA locks for your luggage uh, for uh, traveling and you can run those through there and then you actually have a lock on there if you have genius children that can undo uh, these little key rings. So if you've got that appliance or power tool that you need to keep from being plugged in by someone who's not supposed to, here's a little tip to help make that happen. We'll see you next week on Shop Stop. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find our stories anytime at sunup.okstate.edu. And a reminder, you still have time to vote for your favorite SunUp stories of the year by going to our Facebook page. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you next time at SunUp.